going to be a father in two months. Woo! Yeah. And with that on my horizon, I have become a master of all things fatherhood. Let me tell you, I, I'm, a, I'm a pro. Like, it just come at me, ask me a question, I know. So let me give you a cheat code for this Father's Day, okay? If you have a dad in your life, and if you are a dad, just feel free to amen along the way. I have the ideal Father's Day gift for you. And it's not too late, let me tell you. Find, find a way today to build a campfire. Mm. <laughs> Weather permitting, I mean, don't burn down your house in the process. But there's nothing us men love more than a good campfire, man. Like we, it, it's, it's strange. It like it transcends us a little bit and we just like stare at it. We find a stick that's great and we poke it. <laughs> what are we doing? We, we're, we're stoking the fire. Okay. We put stuff in there like, will it melt? Like, what are we doing? Man, we sit around. Ladies, if you're having a hard time getting your, your husband to talk, build a fire and watch it happen. <laughs> He's going to be ready. He's just ready to talk. Some of my greatest friendships happen around campfires. And they just, they, they pump me up. You know what? You know what marks a great campfire? You wake up the next day. <laughs> he knows. And you, oh, yeah. Remember how great that was? You still smell like it, right? You guys remember my long hair? This stuff would smell for days. It was fantastic. <laughs> oh, you put your favorite jacket back on and, the aroma of the awesome of the night before, it just all comes back to you. Quick poll. No, because I, I know I might be alone on this one. <laughs> Who hates the smell of a campfire? Yeah, Manisa, see you. It's okay, it's okay. Show of hands, who wants to bottle that up and spray it on in the morning before you get into the car? Yeah, my people, come on. <laughs> one objection that I do have to the humble campfire is uh, gas fireplaces, fantastic. Good substitute if it's all you have, if you have a small balcony. But if you're gonna build one and you're gonna get your hatchet or your ax and you're gonna chop wood, because man, I mean, if we're gonna do it, like we're gonna do it right, right? My objection to the, to, to the fire, to the humble fire is uh, splinters. Ah. If you're gonna play with fire, you're gonna get burned or splintered, whatever the saying is. I had a splinter so bad one time uh, because I have a clinical condition where I'm allergic to work gloves. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I was on a, a job site. James, don't listen, please. <laughs> I was on a job site and I picked up a piece of plywood and I had a piece go into my palm so deep I lost it. So I get into my work truck, I got a cold sweat, I put my feet up because I'm going down, and I went to go retrieve it and I couldn't find it. So I go home and, and precious Dina McAllister, I said, help me. <laughs> she, she digs in and she goes, John, I, I don't know, you gotta go to the walk-in. So I go to the walk-in clinic because yes, I need to be told to go to the doctor. And uh, I get there and, and the poor doctor uh, numbs me up and he cuts me open and he goes, I don't know what to tell you, there's nothing there. Dang it. A week and a half goes by and I can't move my thumb anymore. <laughs> it's so swollen and it's oozing goo. And, and I go to a family member who owns a private practice and I'm just like, you gotta, you gotta help me out here. So she cuts me open and she audibly gasps. Not because I didn't tell her the story, but she couldn't believe that there was an inch and a half piece of plywood wedged into the palm of my hand. Woo! Kids, wearing gloves doesn't make you less cool. 
It makes you more dumb, okay? Doesn't take long. <laughs> James <sighs> smells like Jesus does. James's words in his book, they remind us of the awesome that was Jesus's life. James simply points back to what Jesus already said. And throughout his book, what he does is he gives us these little splinters that he's asking us to take out of our hand. Because uh, who wants to just leave a splinter in? No. Splinters don't come out on their own. They get wedged, man. They get stuck and they bother you. I was talking to somebody this week who said that their daughter had a piece of metal stuck in her foot for a month. It's not coming out on its own. And surgery is going to have to happen to remove it. I've been there. But the book of James goes through all of these, these things that are in the body of Christ. And we're going in after them to retrieve them. And let me tell you, it's going to hurt more before it gets better. Because when you go in to get a splitter, you got to make a bigger hole. That's just how it happens. And the book of James is just exposing these things. And James is asking, hey, let's go in after it because you're going to be better for it. Because all of us want the splinter out. So buckle up. It might get a little painful here this morning. But do you know what helps out a splinter? An ice cube. What does an ice cube do? You, you put an ice cube on a splinter and it does a couple things. It, it, it makes the swelling go down. And it draws the splinter up to the surface so that we can get it out. So Holy Spirit, I just invite you here for you to do the work to remove it. Uh, God, you be glorified as we, as we dig in. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's get in. Let's read James's words to the early church, shall we? Because we remember, James is speaking not to everybody, but to the church that's scattered. So James 2, verse 1, says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised those to love him? But... You've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? And from here, James goes into some very uh, steeped in Jewish thought about ranking which law matters more. And he finishes in verse 12 saying, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What words of Jesus is, is James referring to? Jesus says it a bunch of different ways and a bunch, in a bunch of different places, but let me read to you Matthew 22. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here at New Life, we say love genuinely. It's one of our core rhythms here. You see, Jesus, Jesus changed the game. He was often heard saying things like, in the kingdom of God, it's like this, not like that. He says, the greatest in the kingdom is the least. The last shall be first. Be like a child. Right? He's the perfect picture of a human. He was God in flesh. And he called us to something higher. And he showed us how to do it. And James aims to help us. To remind us. To Do you remember church? It's like this. The splinter of partiality is what we're going to dig out today. 
James says, think of two different people coming into your church. So let's imagine, shall we? Let's just, let's just say, you're standing here. New Life is your home church. You're following Jesus together with us, and you're just really on mission. You're doing, you're, you're doing it. And, uh, and you're standing down here, and two people walk in simultaneously through the doors into our church. And they don't appear to be together, but they make their way down the aisle to you. And without words, they gesture, I'm new. What do I do next? Is there somewhere I'm supposed to sit? And you see two people. One person dressed very nicely, whatever that means to you personally. Maybe that's somebody in a suit with a really nice watch and some shiny shoes. Maybe it's a woman with a designer handbag where if you know, you know, you know? <laughs> and she's got some noticeably uh, expensive jewelry on. For me, it's, it's someone walking in with really clean Jordans on and we make eye contact. I'm like, you're my guy, come sit with me. <laughs> Simultaneously, somebody makes their way down to you, the same clues, ah, help. And context clues would tell you that they're pretty, uh, quite possibly struggling with a bout of homelessness. And they don't appear to have bathed recently. They look quite disheveled. Um, their clothes are very practical, not very superficial. They need them. Um, and a noticeable yet slight odor follows them in. What do you do? Partiality in a more approachable word is having a favorite or making a choice. Making a choice. It all starts with who you speak to first. How do you speak to them? Do you offer your hand as a greeting? Or are you a little afraid of where they've been? What they brought in with them? How do you encourage them to engage our services? Hey, come sit with me. What's your name? Or do you say, hey man, free coffee's in the back. <laughs> Better yet, how do you encourage them to engage your personal life outside of this place? James notes that if there's an ounce of difference, that is partiality. That is judgment. And that, he says, is sin. Whoa. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Here at New Life, we say we love genuinely as a core pillar to who we are. And Jesus would say, in the house of the Lord, you can't do that if you categorize people, if you put them in groups. Judgment is the ability to make considered decisions or come to sensible conclusions. An article written by the Department of Psychology in Columbia University uh, says... Organisms are unable to adapt to the demands of their environment will fail to pass on their genes. <laughs> and consequently, they'll fall as casualties to the war of nature, right? Survival of the fittest. That's where it started, is simply survival. Uh, you're on a hike with your family and you're just going along and you run into a bear. Good judgment? Bad judgment? Oh, buddy, bring it in, you look so fluffy. Bad judgment. It started as survival. That's what judgment was, is it was, it was acknowledging a threat in front of you. What am I gonna do? Originally, it was designed to help us thrive in a dangerous world. But now, our world is a little less physically dangerous. Anybody ran into a bear recently? A couple people in Yellowstone with bisons, but that's their problem, not <laughs> Yellowstone's. <laughs> But if we're to be honest, it's still dangerous in our lives, just in a very different way. It's, uh, it's socially dangerous to dress uh, in a different way. Like, ooh, <laughs> hey. It's economically dangerous to put your money towards certain things. And it's interpersonally dangerous to have certain opinions, isn't it? You see, the threat is no longer our safety, but our emotional safety, our identity. Uh, and that's still dangerous. See, judgment is your default. James calls it sin. He calls it a failure, a failure to live up to the law of liberty. 
Uh, but don't get me wrong. Not all forms of judgment are sin. Some of them are, are just practical. Uh, I can have a favorite type of pie and that's not sinful unless it's not apple. <laughs> now it's just opinions and that's not, that's not what we're discussing today because the need to avoid a bear is very natural. But when our judgment devalues God's creation, his blood-bought person, we have a problem. Initially, it was about survival. What does it look like today? Dana uh, Heron, a psychologist in D.C., says, the truth is that judging is something that you do daily. Sometimes you can't help it. She says, judging other people has nothing to do with the people who you are judging about yourself. She says, when someone else has something, it seems like something that you're deprived of. You seem so happy. I'm going to bring you down to my level because you can't be that happy. (laughs) So we try to fulfill our own needs, right? But in the wrong way. Judgmentalism then is about safety. If you're the better person in a given scenario, you don't have to worry that you might be worse. You don't have to reckon with potential feelings of inferiority or shame, right? Because when we compare, it steals our joy, doesn't it? See, the funny thing is, is that we, when we judge another person, we have to actually bring them lower in order to make ourselves feel higher. We have to make them less valuable than the son or daughter of Christ that they are. In a way, we dehumanize them to justify to ourselves that it's okay what we're feeling. Have you driven lately? There's maniacs out there. Everybody's crazy. Where do these people learn to drive? And we point the barrel everywhere but our own uh, hurry. <laughs> we, we have to make them less to justify where we're at. You have to convince yourself that it's okay to be how you're feeling. Then we find ourselves in a place where we neither see others the way they truly are or ourselves the way that we truly are. We inflate ourselves and what we say to God is you're not actually gonna take care of me, I gotta do it myself. This deception keeps us from from seeing anybody the way that Christ is and there's no place for that in the church, is there? She goes on to say, you keep doing it because it's, it isn't what you need. You'll have to judge another person and another and another and another to keep the charade going. But we're addicted to it. So much so that we do it for fun. You see, we seek out opportunities to judge. We watch sports and anybody but your team is the enemy. <laughs> if you're a Raiders fan, let me tell you. Anybody like a good competition show? Uh, Whether it's American Idol or Great British Baking Show or some car building competition or just finding a good deal. Man, we love love to make judgments. We we do it for fun. My wife and I, uh, we like to watch them not really aggressively but for fun, right? And... uh, and anybody ever watch American Idol? And, and you, you, you watch it and you're like, <laughs> I can't sing. But wow, they're gonna make it. And we sit up on our ivory towers of perfect pitch and we give down judgments. <laughs> I love watching cooking shows. Great British baking show. Oh, come on. <laughs> you're, uh, you have inferior gluten development in your ciabatta. Where, where do I get this comment from? I've never made ciabatta before. The British is why I'm saying it that way. <laughs> but we go to reality TV or we go to social media. Anybody we don't know in person that we're not getting influenced by, we're just passing judgment. The water cooler at work, why do we do it? Are we afraid of the silence? We have to gossip in order to, to not be found out? We do it, at, <laughs> we do it for fun. We do it as entertainment. L- let me know if you, uh, if you can see yourself uh, in this video. Watch this. 
I have been trying to get on jury duty every single year since I was 18 years old. To get to go sit in an air-conditioned room downtown judging people while my lunch was paid for? That is the life. Just eat my popcorn. That's the life. <laughs> we judge out of fear. We judge out of lack of enoughness. We judge out of protection of our own self-image. We judge from our ivory towers or our pit of shame. And Jesus says, that's not the kingdom. Not in the church, man. That's why we do it in our culture. What about in James's day? You see, James wrote to a very partial age. It's filled with prejudices and hatred based on class, ethnicity, nationality, religious background. You see, in the ancient world, people were routinely and permanently categorized based, uh, based on whether they were Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich, poor. You see, partiality was not even a word in this day. It's a Jesus idea. It's a Christian thought. Two fish go in for their morning swim. Just swimming. And, and they're just kind of chatting. They're going along doing their thing. And another fish comes at them, right? And he gives them the nod. Morning. He says, the water's great this morning, isn't it? And they just kind of go, uh-huh. Keep swimming. Perplexed, one fish looks at the other and goes, what the heck is water? Think about it. You're swimming in it. You're swimming in the water. You don't even realize what it is, but you're swimming in it. And in James's day, they couldn't even put a word on what partiality was because they were swimming in it. It's all they knew. <laughs> Dr. Randall Smith, when discussing this passage, he notes that the church hasn't really gotten away from this certain sin. We still place people in our lives in categories. We're just swimming, not knowing what water is. <laughs> Dining was a defining ritual in Roman domestic life. It lasted from late afternoon into the wee hours. Uh, typically, nine to 20 guests were invited and arranged in prescribed seating order to emphasize division and status uh, and, and relative closeness to the host. They ate in a, in a room called a triclinium, which translates literally to three couch room. And who knows, if you have three couches in one room, you've made it. Uh-huh. <laughs> These couches, they were at different heights. And they were designated for very different people. The couches were arranged in a U-shape uh, with one elevated table in the middle that food would go on. Where you sat in this room said everything about who you were. And the people walking by this room, they would be able to tell who you were, how rich you were, and where you, what you were born into. If you were the host of the gathering, who was there and where they sat said everything. In this culture, reclining was the ideal posture for dining. If you were at the middle couch, this was the seat of honor. You could speak very easily with the host to your right, and you could look out into the rest of the house where music was happening, where shows were happening. You could see everybody. You could talk to everybody. Everything was, was around you. In contrast, uh, the people to the left of the middle couch uh, that was the highest couch, and that was not the best seat in the house. You had to, to, to kind of contort your body really awkwardly to talk to the most important person in the room. You were often very similar uh, in social standing to the person hosting, and they were showing you what's up. Look who I got. You take your seat over there while they talk to me because they can't see you. Uh, not everybody was able to recline at the table, though. Women and children, they were often um, sitting. You couldn't lay down, you had to sit down. And if you were a slave, you ate either standing up or sitting on the ground in shame. In this day, you did not escape your social standings. 
What you were born into, you stayed into. There was no getting out. There was no going to school and making your own way. Your status was very apparent to those around you and your seat at the table was predetermined. They're just women. This is what we do. Judgment here isn't punishment like we think of in scripture. Judgment here is looking down on someone or showing partiality toward them because of their economic status. It's keeping somebody where they belong. It's putting somebody in a box. You're never gonna be more than this. You ever been in the box towards somebody? What does that mean? You did something and I'm not gonna let you out of this box. Hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. You stay in that box. And honestly, in the world, this makes sense. If somebody has more money, they can do more for you. If somebody has a certain skill set or they have certain notoriety, it brings validity to what you're doing. But Jesus says not in the church. That's just not how it goes here. Do we celebrate the salvation of a celebrity more than the salvation of the addict? If we do, that's dishonoring the addict. And if you have any doubt in your heart, then we're just not reflecting the kingdom. Because it shouldn't, and I don't mean to should on anybody here, but James wants us to have the fragrance of Jesus, and there's no room. Mercy seems to be the answer. When reading this passage, I had a really hard time with the word mercy, if I'm honest, because historically, uh, judgment means punishment, right, which we discussed, but mercy typically means forgiveness, After all, Jesus had mercy on us and welcomed us into relationship. But I thought to myself, what reason does a more wealthy person or person of status have to give mercy to somebody of lower status which they didn't ask for or deserve? What offense has the poor person made to require mercy? It seems like a pretty arrogant view of what we can do for others. Like I'm doing you a favor. You should thank me. That feels very transactional, not very relational. That conflicts with who I know Christ to be, and that's because that's not it at all. Mercy comes from a place of humility. After all, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Mercy, translated in this context, in Hebrew is chesed, meaning loving kindness. A covenant commitment to be faithful to the person. If judgment keeps you where you are, mercy offers you a hand up. God, after all, showed no partiality. Jesus came and he died for the Jew and the Gentile. He was a friend of sinners. He had dinner with the tax collector. He went to the woman at the well and he saw her, not her sin. We're called to be his disciples, his apprentices, to look like him, to sound like him, to remind people of what he's like. I remember that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is the better option. But two people walk in. What do we do? It won't help you climb the ladder, but mercy triumphs. It won't earn you approval with people, but mercy triumphs. It won't make you feel good about yourself, but mercy doesn't need credit. After all, Jesus showed mercy, didn't he? If we struggle with mercy, you are not alone. You are not alone. If you struggle with mercy, a hand up, right? Getting people out of the boxes that either they put themselves into or you put them into. (laughs) Then we need to go to the one who extended mercy to us. When we express gratitude to the one who extended mercy to us, worshiping him in all of his glory, something happens. 
The Holy Spirit works in our hearts and it makes us a people of mercy. It takes that splinter right out. The American author, uh, David Foster Wallace says, there's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody does it. The choice we get is what? What are we going to worship? How's our hearts? Is your heart in the box towards somebody? Is there prejudice? Do you need help seeing people the way that God sees them? I know I do. Mercy triumphs over judgment, but which one's winning in our own hearts? Hear the Roman guard say, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Let that be our prayer as we go into our world. Remember the loving kindness Jesus displayed for the world to see on the cross. He saw us. He saw us. He saw his commitment to you and to I. Not what we'd done wrong. He didn't keep us where we deserved. He said, come here. Sit with me at the right hand of glory. May we, his covenant people, go to him to help with mercy because we can't do it on our own. Can we turn our misplaced worship because he has what we need to survive? We don't have to fight for it on our own through our own means of judgment and comparison. In the book of Revelation, we get this picture of the throne of God, and we see all these living creatures around the throne worshiping forever. We get this picture of these elders, uh, and they all have crowns on their heads, and they're around the throne of God, and I want you to hear what they do. Revelation 4 verse 9 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him. They worship him who lives forever and elder, uh, ever. They take, they lay their crowns before the throne. The crown is, is what tells people your authority. It tells people who you are. It's your lordship. It's your dominion. And they take it off and they say, you are worthy, God. You receive the glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I, I want to offer us a moment of reflection and a moment of worship because this splinter of partiality, man, it, it wedges itself deep. And um, I want to open the altar uh, to do just like the elders did. And if you need to take a crown off and lay it before him, I, I want to give you a moment of reflection just to deal with your own heart and ask the one who gives generously for the mercy that you, you need. Because once we have it, we can extend it. But if we don't understand his mercy, how are we supposed to give it? Let's approach the throne of mercy and ask for what we need. Let's lay our crowns of our lives down and say, Holy Spirit, give us what only you can. So let's enter this time, be with the Lord, take a posture that's appropriate to what you need and let's go before the throne, shall we? of mercy and love at the 
the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 and we cry has what you need. May we go to him, to his throne, and receive. Don't feel condemnation this morning. This is the church talking to the church because we're all there, okay? So anything that you feel that may not be of Christ, let it go away. May the God of mercy be with us. Would you stand with me? Receive this blessing as we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.